everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoyed our last presentation, uh, last panel. Now we're going to move straight into today's uh, third speaker presentation, Social Media Threats and Opportunities by Paolo Girbardo. Um, a little bit about the speaker. Uh, he is a lecturer in digital culture and society at the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. And research he's done is focused on the transformation of politics in the digital era. He's written a book called Tweets and Streets, Social Media and Contemporary Activism, which critically assessed the impact of social media on movements such as the Arab Spring to occupy Wall Street, highlighting not only the potentials, but also the risks of isolation and other things that social media bring to the protest experience. His last book, The Digital Party, explores the transformation of political parties in the digital era, and currently he is writing another book on the ideology of the populist era. If you have any questions about those books, but also primarily about the presentation, be sure to put them in the Q&A box, and we'll get to those after the presentation. Thanks, and Doctor, you can start when you're ready. Thanks very much for having me and for inviting me. Um, in this presentation, I'd really like to uh, take the title seriously, namely assess what are the threats and opportunities that social media offer for politics and for activism, in particular from the perspective of young people and how we can use social media as a means uh, to uh, pursue a progressive politics, uh, a politics that is beneficial to people around the planet, right? rather than a politics that is regressive and fearful and hateful, which is unfortunately the kind of politics that we have often seen on social media in recent years. So first and foremost, let's start with some background, namely what we are seeing now, the use of social media for political purposes has already quite a bit of a tradition, quite a bit of a background. It's not something altogether new. We can say that we are now at the end of kind of 20 years of social media or a bit less than that. Uh, in 2003, MySpace, that has now become the epitome, the epitome of the social media that didn't make it, uh, was founded. Uh, as some of you, the, uh, the people who are older in this room, will remember it was a website allowing bands to uh, show their music, to make contacts with other musicians and other performing artists. And it was already a place, actually, where uh, some form of activism were being experimented, where different candidates, for example, would create their own page in order to communicate with the public, where young people were getting engaged with causes and trying to get their voice heard. Um, so it's already quite a bit of time that social media have been around, and we, uh, at this point, cannot take them anymore, obviously, as an object of curiosity or as something new, uh, but they are part and parcel, really, of, of contemporary politics. Indeed, already MySpace, as I said, was used for a number of campaigns. And then in the following years, uh, all the new social media that were created in the following years, I mean, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and now also the video sharing uh, social media, which can be considered as part of a sort of second generation of social media, are becoming, in due course, uh, new spaces, new sites for politics, for mobilization around causes, be they environmental causes, be causes of racial justice, uh, be causes of gender equality. And uh, uh, therefore, it is very important, in a way, to understand what are the risks and opportunities that this new space of communication offers for us. I say that um, what, what historically what was crucial, really, I mean, that while, again, the first social media were created in the early notice, the real tipping point in the creation of a new form of activism online was 2011. Uh, 2011 was what Time magazine famously celebrated as the year of the protester in its yearly cover. Uh, because it was a year that was marked by a very significant wave of contestation and mobilization worldwide, uh, sparked by the Arab Spring protests, uh, first in Tunisia, uh, then in Egypt, and several other countries that were really characteristic in the way in which they use enthusiastically social media as a space, uh, as a, spring for, a springboard for mobilization. 
and um, it was also a space where new tactics were organized, were, were, were developed. I mean, from using Facebook pages, banally, Facebook fan pages, for example, for political purposes, what has now become a standard, right? I mean, any kind of respectable uh, political social group these days will have its own uh, Facebook fan page and its own Twitter account, perhaps its own uh, YouTube channel. It was really around 2011 that these kind of standards uh, were developed. And it was also around this time that political candidates running for election in different countries, and most notably in the US, started using really as a standard uh, social media as a key means uh, of uh, communication and mobilization. Most notably, you may know uh, the 2008 and 2012 uh, Barack Obama presidential campaign in the US uh, was very uh, um, decisive in this development. Um, it was a campaign that invested a lot, and a lot of money in its digital team and a lot of uh, uh, resources and efforts in using social media as a space where uh, prospective voters could be found and ultimately the election uh, could be won. I mean, ever since, I mean, uh, I think we have uh, gotten to know also the more obscure or worrying side of social media. Obviously, Donald Trump in the US using Twitter, uh, becoming what some people describe as trolling chief, in a sense of using Twitter as a space for very divisive rhetoric, for very poisonous uh, rhetoric. But what one has to give to Donald Trump is that he was a very E and Esteem, right? Because that's uh, what often happens with social media uh, politics. It's not just one person; it's the social media staff that supports the candidates and the leader. Uh, anyway, the kind of Trump camp was extremely effective, extremely good at using the affordances of social media, the rhetoric of social media, the kind of language that fits well in the nature of social media. Because as we know from communication theory and people such as Marshall McLuhan, uh, form and content in communication always go together, right? Uh, in order to communicate well in any given circumstance, one has to produce content that fits the characteristic of the medium. Obviously, in the case of Twitter, for example, the short nature of content requires uh, the ability to uh, make messages extremely short and extremely emotional as social media have, uh, since the very start, uh, inbuilt as a, as, a, as a feature, this emotional element, this personal element, and Trump was really a master at that, right? I think it's really useful also for progressive activists to study uh, Trump's tweets, which tend to have a kind of formal-like uh, structure where the first sentence uh, uh, signals a problem uh, or what in uh, the eyes of Trump was a problem, uh, then there is a second sentence that evaluates this problem, right? Develops that, judges that, uh, takes a stand vis-a-vis -vis this problem. And finally, there is a last sentence, sometimes uh, a one word sentence that is more a call to action or a payoff, what in advertising you would call a payoff, um, which tries really to steer the emotional element. Uh, most notably uh, and hilariously in, in the case of Trump's tweets was sometimes a kind of one word sentence such as sad, bad, mad. I don't know why he liked this kind of uh, uh, sounds. And uh, actually he was really crucial in uh, doing this job of uh, getting people mobilized emotionally, right? Getting, especially getting them angry, which was really the dominant sentiment in the case of Donald Trump's communication. So that's a bit the general picture. I mean, the general picture for me is one where uh, social media are the new political normal. I've been in this field for quite some time. Uh, I've been studying these things since the late, noti since the late 90s. So uh, you can guess from that how old I am. And initially, really for researchers like me, it felt like being in a sort of frontier field uh, where we were doing strange stuff that was not really the serious politics, as you may say. And uh, there was a sense there that, right, it was social media was just a sort of auxiliary medium of sorts, right? Uh, you do the serious politics in rallies, on the campaign trail, uh, in TV studios, and then you do this social media stuff, which is just for young people 
uh, this curious thing of tweeting sometimes or Facebooking or posting YouTube videos. These days, this kind of reasoning is completely anachronistic. Um, social media are increasingly the place where you win political campaigns. Uh, they are not the only place, obviously. I mean, it is still very important to uh, be covered on newspapers, to, be co to, be, to participate in TV debates, to be on TV. Right, because still many people watch that and still these mainstream media still have a very strong defining or primary defining role on social reality but social media have really grown and grown to the point where we can say that they now account for around 50 percent of, of political influence and they're also very important because they are a place where people do not simply communicate but also organize or as some uh, f uh, activist friends uh, put it, they build armies. In a sense, they gather people who share similar ideas, similar interests, gel them together, and motivate them to take uh, uh, direct action, right? To participate directly, either through communication or participating in organizing, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's uh, a picture from Egypt in 2011, uh, and I was in Egypt at the time, and was, what was really striking was how they would use uh, the images, the logos of corporation as content for graffiti, dubbing, the, the writing them on, on walls, which was really strange to me because it was as if uh, suddenly a corporation had become the new hammer and sickle or the new circle day of anarchy, right? That's what you usually find in political graffitis. Uh, but it had a meaning, uh, as I came to, to realize, that sp spoke about the importance that those media had for creating a different type of organization, for creating a different way of doing politics uh, that was quite different from the one uh, older people were familiar with, right? So having introduced a bit the general landscape of social media politics. Let me now do this work of assessing threats and opportunities. Uh, I mean, I'll try to be as simple and perhaps banal as possible, but I think it's perhaps sometimes, sometimes it is good to have these uh, listicles, I mean, these uh, short, li uh, these lists of advantages or disadvantages, threats and opportunities. And given that in the audience here today, there's many young people with an interest in politics and activism, perhaps it's a good way for us to reflect on uh, what is good, what is bad, or what is the potential and the threats in social media activism. So let me begin with the bad news, right, with the threats. Uh, it's always good to get rid of the difficult things first, of the threats first. And I think that there's many threats, I mean, and also the previous speakers, the previous presentations, and the previous panels uh, spoke very much to these threats that we are facing in a social media centric politics. So, threats of which we have become ever more aware in recent years. I think there's been a bit of a transition in terms of, of mood from, from the optimism that was dominant in the early 2010s and very much in the aftermath of 2011. All these protest movements, many of them with a progressive and pro democracy character. New left parties, uh, Podemos in Spain, uh, then with Sanders, Corbyn, uh, and a sort of left revival that was to a great extent powered by social media. But then since 2016, this right-wing populist wave and its use of social media has made people very much aware of the way in which they can also be used for uh, authoritarian politics, right? For regressive politics and the risks that are involved in this landscape. So let me list some of these threats. I mean, perhaps mm, the most apparent one, or at least for more leftist oriented people, is uh, corporate capture, namely the sense that activists, by using social media, are operating in a corporate environment, in a capitalist environment, uh, where uh, the dominant companies are the likes of Facebook, uh, Google, uh, Apple, uh, Twitter, and so on and so forth. These are companies uh, that have big money interests. I mean, they have big capitalist interests. They control the economy. They are responsible for the enrichment of people such as Mark Zuckerberg. And the problem with that is that obviously there can be a contradiction between using a platform for purposes of dissent and contestation 
that often has an economic character and that often also focuses on the bad distribution in economic resources, namely the famous 1%, 99% divide, a society where increasingly few people have uh, tons of money and then there's us, the remaining plebs, who have uh, little money or le definitely less money that, 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 than those people. And I think that that indeed can be a problem, right? In a sense, that can be a problem in terms of the bias that this uh, structure of power can introduce. It can be a problem in terms of, of the uh, algorithms that are designed for, for uh, uh, capitalist purposes, namely making money, right? Uh, which can go against the aims and purposes of more socially uh, oriented uh, people. Yet I would say that this is not something completely new. I mean, activists have always used spaces that were not their own, as it were. I mean, social movements are by their nature uh, um, phenomena that they need to operate in uh, foreign spaces, as it were, in unfamiliar spaces, in spaces they not do not control, that are dominated by others. Um, but this doesn't mean that activism is necessarily bound to failure. It means that uh, one needs to keep this in mind while at the same time using the even small margins that are available within this space to air different views. The second risk, and I think also in the previous panel there was a bit of a discussion of these, uh, is slacktivism or waste of time, or it has many names, this kind of pathology, or is it, as it is described, clicktivism. Namely, the idea there is that what people are doing online is actually a big uh, um, distraction from more serious politics or more serious activism, because people are ultimately just chatting and talking and liking and that this can divert people from more, um, or you say, more uh, tiring effort. For example, being active in your neighborhood, being active politically, participating in campaigns, participating in meetings, which as we all know, or the people who have participated in meetings know, are tend to be quite boring, right? Uh, but can also uh, be useful and necessary ultimately to develop a political agenda and can give people a kind of wrong sense, misplaced sense of having done something when they actually have done very little. I mean, an example that was used to make this point where all these sites like click here or like this page if you want to save uh, children in Africa from starvation, right? I mean, all these weird uh, Facebook pages or groups uh, that really uh, operating with these uh, weird assumption that right it was enough liking things yet at the same time uh, i would also say that there is a tendency to uh, overlook that activism in any era has involved communication and communication is not a waste of time for activism communication is often the precondition for taking action because people can only take action if A, they know there is a problem, right? And somebody needs to communicate there is a problem. Otherwise, how will people know about it? Second, if they know that there are other people who are concerned about the same problem, because if you know there is a problem, but you don't know there are people who are doing something about it, you will not take action. And finally, if people are motivated to join that group that promises to take action, on the problem at point A. And this is all communication, right? I mean, people in the past would do it in different ways. They would use badges or political symbols. They would use political flags. Uh, they would use protest signs. They would paint graffiti uh, on walls. Uh, they would use t-shirts with Che Guevara or your favorite political hero. And all of this activity was not really a waste of time because it was about uh, creating a collective identity and firing people enthusiasm. I mean, regardless of whether you share a certain cause or not, right? I mean, really any campaign needs to do that. I mean, let's take an example I think most of us don't like. I mean, MAGA hats, right? I mean, MAGA hats were not a waste of time from the perspective of Trump supporters. They were about giving Trump supporters a common identity, giving Trump supporters a common hashtag, giving a rallying point so that they could get together as a precondition to act together. 
the third um, track there, one I think many of us are also familiar with is flames or trolling or online hate. Read really the stone of that, right? The stones of that online. I mean, I don't know if it's just me and I'm a particularly uh, person who attracts a lot of hate, but whenever you post something, you will always get the usual uh, person who just comes there really to troll you. And when you go much higher in terms of visibility, right, uh, when you're a political figure, when you're a political leader, when you're an activist, you're bound to get tons of that. And in a way, social media uh, create this effect of disinhibition, in the sense that people feel protected behind the screen, um, often also behind anonymity, and therefore they feel uh, the freedom to say things they probably will never say face to face uh, because of fear also that uh, whatever a confrontation may escalate into something worse. So that is definitely a problem of social media. It has made society more vociferous. It has also shown how polarized society is around different issues, be they of economic uh, distribution, right? Whether we should keep a system in which the rich get richer and the poor poorer, or in terms of values, right? Whether we should aim for a society of racial justice and gender equality, or whether we should aim as the right ones for a conservative society where we, in a way, we go back in time. But in that context, I think too often we blame social media for problems that are really social, right? That, that are, have more to do with society as such. It's a bit like the usual kind of shooting the messenger in a way. It's not the problem that in a way people communicate those ideas we don't like. The, the first problem is that people think those things. Social media has only made those toxic ideas more visible that perhaps before they were less visible and uh, uh, that, in a way, was more comforting, perhaps, uh, but also it gave us a false illusion that society was more like we were. And I think one needs to accept that politics is about conflict. Politics is about people clashing. Politics is about people holding radically different ideas. That's something that is ineliminable. Obviously, we should stamp out uh, hate, uh, threats, uh, all the disgusting things that uh, we see on social media, much of that is fundamentally illegal, right? The most extreme forms of that are illegal and should be stamped out, yet we should at the same time accept that people will always, always disagree. And we should also develop a bit, a bit of a thick skin vis-a-vis -vis certain positions, right? Uh, because otherwise, in a way, we leave uh, free terrain to people with regressive views that perhaps perhaps tend to have a thicker skin than people of, of more progressive views. I mean, that to me is a very important imperative if we want to build progressive politics on social media. And finally, celebrity culture. I mean, here is Bono, uh, that to me represents, in a way, really the ills of a certain celebrity activism. I mean, this idea that, you know, it's enough for celebrities, uh, pop singers, to uh, send uh, love messages and... Uh, a hug, uh, the powerful of the world, the rich people of the world, and everything will be solved, right? These people go into the big meetings and summits of the World Trade Organization or the World Economic Forum, and basically telling us, don't worry, you don't need to do anything. You just need to clap at me, and I will solve the problem for you. What often happens is that they don't solve anything, right? Because first and foremost, these people are very, very rich, and guess what? People who are very, very rich tend to share the same interests of other people who are very, very rich, regardless of whether they think of themselves as progressives or regressives. So that's, uh, there's more bad news. Uh, I have a bit of a long list uh, of bad things. I mean, the final problem is fake news. I mean, obviously, we have also seen how many charlatans there are online, how many people who uh, improvise themselves as experts in anything, including vaccines, uh, which just shows the degree of credulousness, I think you say in English, I mean, the uh, availability to buy into any quack theory, just sometimes for the sake of saying, hey, I'm smarter than others. I mean, everybody thinks vac vaccines are good. No, I'll tell you why they're wrong. 
which is a bit of a tendency, in a, especially if you think in the middle class, there are people who think they are better than others and they can even whatever outsmart experts. Um, so much of this phenomenon really is worrying, has been worrying in different different levels. I think, but the COVID pandemic has been really the place where we have seen how dangerous this is because fundamentally people have died because of that, right? People have died because they believed to people airing very stupid and ridiculous theories online, making people afraid of vaccines uh, with the ultimate result that some people have uh, died because of believing in this uh, stupid information. Uh, but perhaps one also needs to be careful on that point not to think that everything can be solved with censorship. Because also the right actually uses that as a kind of retroalimentation mechanism to show, look at liberals, look at libtards, right, as they call them, or look at progressives. They are there always silencing different views. They are always there wanting to say, uh, wanting to impose on people certain views. Yeah. So again, it's always a matter of degrees, right? The same with conflict and hate speech you can bar the most extreme forms of fake news from social media and do that using legal measures but then there will be slighter kind of more dog whistle uh, fake news or dog whistle racism that cannot be altogether stamped out uh, without pain and heavy costs in terms of uh, of credibility and legitimacy so let, let's now finally look at the opportunities i um, hope i'm not running too late uh, in terms of time. I mean, in terms of opportunities, uh, I think one, oh, the, the image is the same as fake news, but whatever. I mean, <laughs> I think one element that also needs to be accepted and perhaps for me is one of the most hopeful element of social media politics is people's voice. Social media have given the opportunity to people who never express themselves politically to express themselves in public by means of writing. This is the first time in history that, the, that something like this is, is happening. That people who before never spoke in public are now actually writing in public about politics. Often they're writing with grammar mistakes, with spelling mistakes. But I think it is really beautiful, uh, even when it's not perhaps beautiful to read because it's full of mistakes. Uh, because at least it shows interest, it shows an effort. And it has a huge pedagogy potential, right? I mean, one should actually congratulate people for wanting to express themselves. And one should also try to educate people, to engage positively with people, also if they have weird views, uh, to say, hey, I mean, first, it's great that you want to express yourself. And I will uh, say what I think, and we'll perhaps find some middle ground and, and some ways to take this forward. So second positive element of in crowd gathering, that's, um, I mean, you, there's a lot of talking about online crowds, uh, smart mobs, uh, social media crowds. And I think it is really something important about social media. A key affordance of social media is that on social media, people do not simply interact and communicate with one another. People also gather. They gather mentally, right? They don't gather physically. But this gathering, the coming together of people around interest, then uh, is uh, a precondition is a resource that can be used to actually mobilize people politically to the point perhaps also mobilizing them uh, in physical protest events. Uh, it is a process of funneling, as, as I describe it in some of, of my work, where you first bring people together in the same conversation, then basically you bring people together in the same mailing list, you gather people's contacts, and through those contacts, through those resources, you can then mobilize people to take action also offline. Another element is leadership building. Leadership is beautiful. Leadership in the sense of leadership for the people, for ordinary people, is a beautiful thing. We shouldn't distrust leadership because leadership is the way in which ordinary people can find someone who represents them. There's many positive examples, such as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or at least examples I sympathize for, that have shown how social media can be used to create charisma, to create credibility, to create following for people because there's no leaders without following, right? And uh, as the very language of Twitter tells us, uh, it is a space of followers, followers looking for leaders. Social media can be used to uh, create trust around the figure, to allow this person to talk about 
is her biography, is her experience to harness people's passion around focal point, bringing people together. I'm almost done. The, um, having listed a bit the positive aspects for me, I think, again, going back to an element already raised before, we should accept that social media is a new political battlefield. It's a new political battlefield with its own rules, where people are bound to uh, meet and clash with one another. Obviously, we want this clash to happen in the most peaceful way possible, in the most amicable way possible, but often it needs to be accepted that people will have strong disagreements with one another. And one there needs to revive the tools of public speaking, of public expression, of debating, right, which are a beautiful component, especially of Anglo-Saxon, of uh, democratic uh, tradition in, in, in Britain and in the US, uh, the um, power of persuasion, the power of persuading people, accepting that people may not agree with us at the start, but we can convince them that our point is right. And I think social media is really a place where this can be done. And this is all for me. Great. Thank you so much for that. And uh, lots of positive reactions on the screen right now from everyone. With that, we'll jump right into our, um, our Q&A. So some people have asked questions during the presentation, and we'll just go by what people voted the most. Um, so the first one is from Aditi, and it says, uh, what are your views on the kind of journalism prevalent on social media, which has been aided by the ease of producing and promoting content that these platforms have to offer? My view is that on the one hand, um, perhaps journalism has never been so influential, but uh, there is also now a lot of burden for journalists because as some colleagues of mine have, have shown in their studies, I mean, once upon a time, a journalist had to write a piece a day or less than that, right? You had time to do your research, to inform yourself, to write in good English, now journalists are expected to write the piece and on top of that to tweet about it and on top of that perhaps to do a short video and on top of that to do some facebook post and on top of that to reply to the replies which means that often journalists are overwhelmed by all these duties and tasks this is not a good recipe for good journalism um, also as we know social media have taken away a lot of economic resource resources from newspapers because what are social media about money-wise? Advertising, right? These are advertising media. Um, this is what they've been accused of, and rightly so. Facebook, Twitter, and other social media have, in a way, cannibalized the advertising pot of mainstream media. Now there is an inversion in this trend, partly due uh, to paywalls. I mean, uh, like it or not, is the way in which many newspapers are, for example, the New York Times, are solving the issue of uh, getting money. And in a way, you need to find a way to get money if you want to pay journalists, uh, and because journalists are the people who produce journalism. Right? Citizen journalism is cool. It is nice that people get involved in that. But I think we also need to reclaim the professionalization of journalism. So journalism is not something anyone can do as a hobby. Yeah. Yeah. Doctor, there's just one more thing in that regard. Today, with the yeah. ease of promoting and producing content, a lot anyone can be a journalist. Tomorrow, I can go and write a piece stating that this is my first-hand mm -hmm. experience. And because social media is also guaranteeing me some level of anonymity, and the readers aren't really demanding my qualifications on social media. What they really want is content that they like to read or a content that's easy to read, which can be swiped through easily with various posts, etc. So do you believe that uh, there is less level of accountability in journalism coming through social media as well? I'd say that, yes, that is a risk. There is a risk of uh, lesser accountability, but then also, you know, many bloggers or many more, how would you say, kind of uh, self-produced journalists, often uh, they end up becoming professional journalists. I mean, I think Ezra Klein of the New York Times, for example, right, he was a blogger, then went on to work for the New York Times. Um, if you or people are finding ways, for example, to fund themselves through Patreon or Substack, um, 
more generally, yeah, there is a problem of the inst institutionalization of journalism, in the sense that before there were some clear rules in terms of gatekeeping, in terms of, of expectations. Now these rules are a bit more loose. Um, but at the same time, we also see that the audience of social media is actually quite good at spotting charlatans and spotting fake news. So perhaps there is that element of bottom-up uh, control that can make up uh, for other problems. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll go to our next question from James, who asks, is there a similar process by which armies on social media grow into physical violence and riots? And I'll invite him on the stage to see if he wants to talk more. Yes, I mean, there is a process in terms of, of, of events that are launched uh, and uh, most notably, again, like the Capitol riots on 6th of January 2021, a few months ago, it was a very clear uh, example of that. You can launch an event on social media and gather people there. People are being radicalized online and then gather offline. And, and, and that can be sometimes dangerous. Uh, but I think, I mean, the, the term army is social media army or digital army is used also in a more ironical sense, also in progressive groups, right? In a sense mm -hmm. to to say that, I mean, mass politics require masses, right? Masses of people, requires numbers of people, requir requires quantity. Um, if you really want to break uh, the, the kind of... Uh, um, you say the, the censorship in terms of, of people, lack of attention around things, you need mass, masses of people to come together and do something, uh, and, and perhaps then also protesting. Yeah. Uh, there is a risk, though, that obviously this is uh, exploited by the right, uh, that is very good in creating cults, in creating quasi-religious -religi movements, uh, where people get mm, very, uh, they get very separated from society. They go into their own rabbit hole. And if they end up believing what they're told, that can be really dangerous. And the uh, uh, doctor had one more question uh, was, how can we sort of enforce um, more order from social media to the real world? Like uh, in the US here still, we have the police arresting people who like are bragging about participating in the riots and stuff. So is there a better way to enforce this, you know, given privacy laws and all of that? I would just say, I mean, I'd say that um, there are already laws there for many things. Sometimes the temptation people have is to create new laws, uh, while much of many of the crimes, right, that are committed on social media, they're basically just the digital manifestation of crimes that have been around for, for a very long time that have to do with abuses of freedom of expression, right? Because, I mean, freedom of expression is a freedom, but it cannot be used, for example, to threaten people or to uh, use racial insults or uh, sexist insults and the like. Um, again, it's a matter of um, yeah, being careful in a way not to also overstep ourselves in terms of uh, policing. Uh, conversations because again a key narrative in the reactionary right is this idea that there is a big conspiracy of basically people like you and me right whatever progressives who are there conspiring to stop people from expressing themselves and protesting so if one oversteps um, say control and order uh, on social media, the risk is that this narrative is going to uh, look at that as proof that they are right. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, next, we're, we have someone who asked a couple of questions, so I'll invite them to the stage to, I guess, ask one of them. So, um, uh, greetings, Doctor. Uh, so I have a few questions. Uh, I think all of them tie into each other. So uh, my basic question is, are political organizations, now I'm not referring to the ones that were formed really physically and then came to online platforms, but purely ones that have been created online. Now, are these organizations more chaotic than effective? Because most of the chaos that they cause or the 
political movement that they start do not carry through into any form of legislations because they don't have a general organizational structure. Yes, that's a very important question, I think. Uh, and uh, Tefeshki that was referred to in the previous panel actually made the point that one risk of social media uh, focus politics is that people get this illusion of having created something where they didn't go through the um, laborious process of establishing structures, recruiting people, creating um, movements on the ground, creating local sections or cells of your organization. I think that is a risk indeed. Um, and also the, another risk is uh, falling prey of the illusion that social media eliminate the need for organization. I mean, some people say just Clay Shirky made this point. Basically, we just need a, an app these days and the app will gather people and, and do the thing. Uh, it doesn't work like that, right? I mean, uh, uh, organizational work is something that happens on social media, but also happens face to face through personal relations, through people being in meetings, right? And that is still very much relevant, right? And that needs to be, uh, is also literacy, right? That many younger people don't have because we are coming out of a long phase of depoliticization where compared to our parents, for example, we are less used to be in a meeting. Yet those are skills and experiences that we need if we want to uh, do a politics that is not just uh, flashes and then collapse, right? This kind of flash in the pan modality that is often typical of social media protests. Uh, professor, to just follow up to that question, yeah. uh, I have just one more question. So uh, you said in your uh, presentation that uh, when we use social media, most of them is capitalistic, where we threat them operating on a profit motive and like creating echo chambers and the supply of information that may harm mm -hmm. us. Uh, versus on the other hand, if we were to have a government run administered social platform, we may risk being easily censored by the government as to anything we say on it. Now, which is probably the lesser of the two evils and how do you see this particular aspect of it? Yes, I think there you are quite right. So, um, I mean, I mean, what would you say? It's, uh, I mean, as I said, um, I, I think that this is not altogether new. That people are forced to use platforms that are commercial in character and using them for other purposes that are more political. I mean, you can also say that there are some state media. I mean, now you write on on Twitter, uh, state media is marked as a kind of a special uh, with a special marker, right, to tell you that it can be dangerous. Indeed, it can be dangerous, especially if it's owned by an authoritarian state. But for example, say the BBC, right, the British Broadcasting Corporation, is known as a very excellent media. It is a state media, right? Uh, so public broadcasting actually in uh, much of Europe as a tradition of being uh, a quite democratic uh, place uh, for for a conversation and, and, and debate and, and for, for, for information that is less biased often than the more commercial media. I mean, if I had to choose between Marduk media, which is private, right, and uh, public media such as the BBC, in, in that context, I definitely choose the public media. Uh, the question is, though, when you have a social network which is about basically individuals and that basically runs on surveillance, uh, uh, whether a state media uh, can be more more dangerous, right, in, in potentially than, than a commercial one. I think there are also other models that don't fall neatly into either the kind of private or public um, form, uh, in a sense of uh, uh, social media, in a sense of civil society media uh, or uh, media that have a social purpose, perhaps kind of private companies, but with a very clear stated uh, social purpose um, with a sense of being basically utilities, right? Of being something that is not, where profit is not the principal motive, but the, the main motive is instead giving people service, giving people a service in that case, being the service of providing people with space for expression, for freedom of expression. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Great.
Uh, we'll go on to now Megan, who asked a question. I'll let her ask it if she wants. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, you recommended that political leaders have a strong presence on social media, which is you know very understandable. But what are your opinions, however, about the conduction of foreign diplomacy and you know similar forms of discourse and interaction between leaders on social media? You know, where do you draw the line? Do you think that's okay to be conducted to, or do you think there are you know certain lines of formality when it comes to you know having political leaders on kind of a more of an informal platform? Yes, that, that's an interesting question. I think also that there is a kind of body of literature that is uh, has been dedicated to that uh, recently. Um, I mean, obviously, diplomacy is something that tends to happen in very reserved context, in more kind of reserved, formalized channels, on which we see very little. Um, but for example, precisely Trump's um, very um, loud use of social media led, for example, some people to uh, be concerned about what happens if Trump says we should go to war with China on Twitter, right? I mean, would that lead to an escalation, potentially whatever, nuclear war? Uh, it is evident that this lack of filters, this lack of mediation, which is really uh, central to social media, can also to um, to uh, antipathies, to clashes between nations, to diplomatic controversy escalating faster than the case would be otherwise, right? especially if uh, politicians of different countries start replying or flaming with one another, right? In a way, in a way, they couldn't do at all on before that, and, and we've seen some episodes of that, right? I mean. Uh, uh, Especially now, I mean, I think there's some Chinese politicians kind of replying against uh, Trump's uh, or, I mean, U.S. politicians. Um, so I think, yeah, th that raises some uh, some concerns, um, and that also, in a way, calls for for etiquette, in a sense of a series of rules of behavior, of accepted behavior. More generally, social media politics needs that; it needs to be made clearer what is good conduct. Like what is acceptable conduct on social media and more specifically in that case what is acceptable conduct on social media with reference to international relations and then can i do a quick follow-up as well um yeah. so i guess what are your thoughts then um on something where it's constructed to a word count on like twitter very um publicly exposed the the leaders are not sitting in the same room together it's not an extended Committee, do you think you know meaningful solutions can come out of you know foreign diplomacy conducted that way? Um, what would you say? No, it is hard to say that in a sense that I mean you, diplomatic decisions are taken again in uh, in discussions that are reserved by, by nature. I mean that's the old rule of, of diplomacy, but always diplomacy has also availed itself of more public a more public element for example in the preparation of uh, diplomatic discussions where leaders would make grandstanding uh, uh, postures for example saying yes we will show whatever to china that they need to stop doing that or we will show the us so sometimes this happens these days on, on social media precisely right kind of like with uh, muscle flexing you could say right it's kind of this muscle flexing uh, which is, uh, I mean, a part of the negotiation for, for, for anything, right? In a way, like it's for, for jobs or for companies, there's always an element of, of bluffing, of saying that uh, you uh, pretending, right? Pretending that you actually want more than what you're actually going to achieve. I mean, we saw also, again, in reference to US and China with Trump's trade war with china right they went like big mu muscle flesser then actually the deal he got was very lame uh, and uh, and actually part of that part of the preparation process the happened on social media so that's a good case study of that thank you cheers 
And I think we have time for just uh, one more question because I know we started a little late from VG. I'll invite them on the stage now. Hello. So uh, my question to you is that there are sleeper cells like uh, that political actors hire themselves over social media. And as a result, they promote or propagate the ideas that these political actors possess. And they have a huge influence over people like all of us. So how do we identify people like these? And also, do you think that present day journalism is uh, somewhat the plays a role somewhat like sleeper cells? Okay, uh, I mean, sleeper cells, I mean, are you referring to, um, what would you say, uh, people who are basically paid bloggers, for example, paid by the state or paid by political forces? Is that what you're referring to, Vidi? Is that what yes. you have in mind? Yes. Yes, uh, yes I mean, fake accounts uh, uh, and you know there was a lot of debate around that around the time of Trump's victory right in 2016 whether that, that was aided by some these people disingenuously presenting themselves as activists while, while they were actually funded by by Russia or whichever other political political force indeed that that is i mean there is a risk obviously especially on twitter right because of the more culture of anonymity on twitter you mm, rarely i mean unless a person uses a, a named account it is very hard to establish who this person actually is what are his or motives in doing something uh, so there is an element of uh, opacity there and there is an element where this can be used to fuel um, divisive and toxic discourse and can be used to legitimize other genuine actors i mean it's very hard to see how, how we can i mean obviously you can report accounts if they have activities that is clearly going against community guidelines or clearly going against the spirit right of um of, of peaceful conversation in other cases i think i think really that the only thing you can bet on is people literacy a sense of political literacy people awareness um is the same thing for for fake news right i mean in the long term the only thing you can really hope in is that people come to be able to discern what is genuine activity from non-genuine activity uh, whether an account or whether some, some communication looks strange and uh, or whether it is legitimate there's not much of a, 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 a other way around that and indeed news media are to blame for biased information i think uh, i'm sometimes really appalled by how biased information is on online right and not biased only because it is in favor of kind of authoritarian causes. I mean, I think like there's a lot of bias in, in, in covering up how unequal our society is, right? Uh, there's a lot of blaming the poor for being poor. I guess the famous Paris Hilton t-shirt, like stop being poor, right? Actually, that, that's a lot of the kind of message and communication we get while we hear so little about how monstrous is the wealth that some people have, which is quite unprecedented in history. Right? I mean, in history, there's always been rich people, and it's fine. I have no problem with someone being rich, but this, what is scary is that there are people who are so rich, they can basically could buy themselves an entire country like Hungary and can buy themselves media like the Washington Post. And then when a very, very, very rich person can buy himself a media, that gets the, the, the person I think is really dangerous for democracy because how do I know whether the media is telling me the truth or not? So more democracy in media ownership, I think is the only insurance policy against that because it is obvious that when you have a lot of money, you don't want to give a penny of that to anyone. I mean, if I had all that money, I would do the same. So uh, really what we need, I think is more 
democratic ownership. Ownership is fundamental. It needs to be more spread. That doesn't mean that each of us will have the Washington Post. That mm, ideal wars don't exist. But between the ideal war scenario and the completely un unideal scenario we have now, there needs to be something in between. Great. Thank you so much to everyone that asked questions today. I think we're over time by about 10 minutes now. So um, again, thank you, doctor, for taking the time to talk today. And thanks to all of our uh, participants for asking questions. Thanks very much for having me. It was really a pleasure. I mean, it really, it's, it's good to be able to interact with young people who have a political interest, who are enthusiastic about politics and, and campaign and activism. So I really hope this was useful and it was definitely useful for me to hear your views and to get to know your experiences. Thanks very much.